Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you all to our seventh session on the tafsir of Surah Al-Anbiya, which is the 21st Surah of the Quran. Uh, we reached ayah number 25. And just to kind of uh, quickly recap uh, what we discussed last week, the verses that we covered last week was in it was essentially Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala proving the concept of Tawheed and also refuting the, uh, the concept and the ideology of Shirk. And because people throughout history have attributed divinity to certain prophets like Uzair, like Isa ibn Maryam, you find that continuing the discussion on Shirk, Allah addresses this uh, the, the shirk that has come in the form of attributing divinity to prophets, which is why in ayah number 25, we read, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa ma arsalna min qablika min rasoolin illa nuhi ilayhi annahu la ilaha illa ana fa'budun. And we have, and indeed we have not sent before you any messenger except that we reveal to them that there is no God but me, so worship me. You find that this verse is very powerful because it begins with a negation. Wama, ma, anafia, as we say in the Arabic language. So the ma. That, 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 that is found before the word arsalna, wa ma arsalna is a negation. And it's a negation followed by an exception, which is a very emphatic way of expressing an idea. And I'll give you a very simple example. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have said, we sent every messenger with the idea of Tawheed, or Allah could have said, we revealed to every messenger that there is no God but me, so worship me. But you find interestingly that Allah says, we have not sent a single messenger except that we reveal to them there is no God but me. So it's a much more emphatic way of uh, expressing the idea. And an example that we can give is, is to say, you know, if, if you were a professor and you gave an assignment and you wanted to really emphasize that you gave your students homework, for example, the professor could say, I gave, I gave every student an assignment. That's one way of saying it. But imagine the professor says, I did not leave a single student unless I gave them an assignment. So you see the second way has much more emphasis. So you find that from this verse, we discover that the essence of every prophetic mission from the time of Adam to the final messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, everything revolved around Tawheed. And you find that Allah doesn't only reveal that the idea that there is no God but me. Tawheed is not just an idea. It's not just a, it's not just a, uh, a belief, which is why the verse ends with fa'budun. When you conceptualize monotheism, when you understand Tawheed, it entails action in the form of Ubudiyya. So we should never think that the oneness of God is just an idea that we have in our minds. Tawheed is something that is existential. It's something that necessitates action. It necessitates our behavior. Tawheed needs to be reflected in our behavior. 
that we only trust Allah, that we only seek his help, that we see him as the, the source of peace and tranquility. So fa'budun means that now that you know that there is only one creator, there is only one sustainer, there is only one being who has control of the affairs of the universe, it's not enough to just believe in it theoretically. Fa'budun, so worship me. So you see that Tawheed has also a very practical dimension. It entails uh, ubudiya, and there's a there's a uh, an interesting uh, statement. It's actually mentioned in Nahjul Balagha, where Imam Amir al Mu'minin salam in the famous letter that he wrote to one of his sons. And this was a letter that he wrote on his way back from Safin, I believe. So this was a letter that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib writes, advice that he gives to his son, whether it's Imam al-Hassan or Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyya, it doesn't really matter who the, the recipient of the letter is. The point is in this letter, Amir al muminin he mentions Tawheed and he says, and know, O my son, Imam Amir al muminin is speaking to his son in the letter. Oh my dear son, if Allah had partners, his, mes his messengers, the messengers of that partner would have come to you. وَعْلَمْ يَا بُنَيْ أَنَّهُ لَوْ كَانَ لِرَبِّكَ الشَّرِيكَ لَأَتَتْكَ رُسُولُهُ If Allah had a partner, that partner would have also sent prophets and messengers, but you find that there is, there is unity in the messages. There is a coherence. There is consistency in all of the messages of all of the prophets from Adam until the Holy Prophet, which is really interesting because whether you're talking about Adam, Sheath, Idris, Nuh, Musa, Isa, Yusuf, all of them, without exception, they spoke about one God, one supreme being. So Amir al-Mu'mineen, which is a very interesting, which is a very beautiful argument, he says that if Allah had a partner, the messenger, th that partner would have sent messengers. We would have heard that there are prophets, you know, in every generation who spoke about this partner that God has, this, this co-God, if, 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 you know, if that's the right expression. You would have seen the signs of his power and his kingdom. And you would have seen, you would have been familiar with the attributes and the actions of this deity. But we find that he is only one, just as he has described himself. In ayah number 26, again, continuing the discussion on polytheism and shirk and its different forms. So on the one hand, you have people who attributed divinity to prophets. And they would, they would say that they're partners. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings up the issue of those who who made the claim that Allah has children. So some say that he has partners. And here, the discussion on why, get, why Allah cannot have children. Ayah number 26, And they say, now, here Allah is addressing the mu'mineen. He's addressing the believers. And he's saying, they say, the beneficent, Ar-Rahman, the exceedingly merciful, has taken a child. وَقَالُوا اتَّخَذَ الرَّحْمَانُ وَلَدًا 
Subhanahu, glory be to him. Bal ibadun mukramun. Nay, but they are nothing, they are honored servants. Now, why does why does this verse mention the name Ar Rahman? Of all the names to mention, why? Because in other verses, you know, it says, But here, specifically, Ar Rahman, the name Ar Rahman is mentioned. Why is that? Now, Allah is addressing the believers, and it's it's almost that Allah is expressing, you know, I hate to use the word shock because it's a very, it's a, it's kind of a description that's more befitting for human beings. But, you know, just so we can understand, it's Allah is essentially expressing his shock and his amazement over the fact that they are ascribing a child to him. So why Ar-Rahman? It seems that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding these people who ascribe children to him that have you forgotten my, my boundless mercy that I brought you into existence from nothing, that I've created you, that I've sustained you, and you have the audacity to attribute a child to me as though I'm some type of biological organism? So Allah, when he invokes the name Ar-Rahman, it's really to kind of put these people in their place that you, you people, you have the audacity to ascribe a child to God while Allah is Ar-Rahman, the exceedingly merciful who brought you into existence from nothing, who created you and who sustains you at every moment, who created the material world who created the cells that make up your body, who created the system of reproduction. You ascribe a child to me? There's like a tone of shock in this verse. They say the beneficent has taken a child. What is, what is the refutation? The refutation is one word. Subhana. Subhana, now I know it says in the translation, glory be to him, but Subhana, it's, it's a word that conveys the idea that, that God is too sublime, that he is far away from imperfections and limitations and bodily dimensions and the needs of creatures. So subhana is a word that negates any weakness, any imperfection, any shortcomings, any, any limitations. And the reason why is because having a child, you know, there, there are only a few reasons why a being would have a child. Now, if you just think about human beings, why, why do human beings have children? You know, there are many possible reasons. You know, number one, just from a, a biological, an evolutionary perspective, we reproduce to pass on our genes because we are mortal and we have children so we can live vicariously through them, so they can carry our name, so we can continue to exist through them because we're not eternal. We die. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al hayyu ladhi la yamut. He is the living who does not die. So he doesn't need a child to carry on his name in the same way that you and I, we have children so they can live after us. And when people see our children, they can remember us, that we, our memory will continue through our children. But Allah is eternal. Allah doesn't, he's not subject to death. We have children also because we get lonely, right? You know, you want to fill your house with, with other people, right? So it's to fill, you know, this loneliness, this emotional void that we have. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not, he doesn't get lonely. He doesn't have that emotion of loneliness. He doesn't have a need that, that needs to be uh, filled, fulfilled. 
Some people have children because they want someone to take care of them when they become elderly. You know, when you get old, you want a family member, someone to look after you. You, you want children for support. But Allah, Allah has no weakness. He is the all-powerful. He is the omnipotent. So he's eternal. He doesn't have any void that needs to be filled. And nor does he need any help. He is the all-powerful. And you find that even in Surah Maryam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a dua that Zakaria made. Zakaria alayhi salam, according to some traditions, he was in his 90s and he didn't have an heir. He didn't have children. Allah in Surah Maryam, Surah number 19, verses 2 to 6, Allah says, Dhikru rahmati rabbika abdahu Zakaria. A mentioning of a mentioning of the mercy of, of your Lord to his servant Zakaria. He whispered to his Lord when he stood in his prayer chamber. He says, Oh Allah, oh my Lord, my bones are frail and my head has become white. And I have I've always been consistent in my supplications to you. I'm worried about my corrupt relatives and my wife is, is barren. So give me a son. So here, why is Zakaria asking for a son? Because of the fra frailty of his bones, because he's getting old. He needs someone to help him. He has this fear that his relatives are going to take his wealth and use it for to spread corruption. They're going to use it in unethical ways. So the element of old age and weakness and fear is the reason why Zakaria السلام, wants to have a son. And it's the reason why most people want children. But none of these reasons can be ascribed to God because they are all weaknesses. Which is why after Allah says, وَقَالُوا اتَّخَذَ الرَّحْمَانُ وَلَدًا He says, Subhanahu, Allah is too sublime. He's above any of these needs and these weaknesses. Now in, in Arabia, other than idols, the Arabs also believed that angels were the daughters of God. So you have the Christians and the Jews on the one hand, who believe Jesus is the son of God. Some Jews believe that Uzair was the son of God. And you have the, some of the, uh, the pre-Islamic Arabs during Jahiliya. They believed that Malaika, they believed in angels, but they believed that these angels were the daughters of God. They were the daughters of Allah. Here Allah, at the end of the ayah, he says, Bel ibadum mukramun. These prophets, that you have ascribed divinity to. And these angels that, that these prophets that you've claimed that you claim are my sons, and these angels that you claim that you assert are my daughters, they are merely honored servants. Ibad. Allah reminds us that they are all my servants. Ibadun mukramun. Now The, the statement that God has a son is really a monstrosity. You know, even in the uh, in Surat Al-Kahf, verses 4 and 5, when Allah speaks about the mission of the Prophet, Allah actually singles out this issue about people considering certain individuals the sons of God. So Allah in ayah number four of Surah Al-Kahf, he says about the Prophet, الَّذِينَ One of the jobs, one of the roles, one of the duties of Rasulullah is to warn those who say, وَيُنذِرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا اتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ وَلَدًا That the Prophet is there to warn those who claim that God has a child. 
Allah says, they have no knowledge. They have no idea what they're talking about. This is a statement that is not rooted in knowledge. Their forefathers were also ignorant. They had no knowledge. And then Allah says, كَبُرَتْ كَلِمَةً تَخْرُجُ مِنْ أَفْوَاهِهِمْ That what a, mo- what a monstrosity, what a blasphemous thing that they have uttered. Allah, look, Allah is saying this. كَبُرَتْ كَلِمَةً تَخْرُجُ مِنْ أَفْوَاهِمْ what, what blasphemy comes from their mouths? They speak nothing but a lie. This has no reality. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a physical being. He's not a biological organism. He is too transcendent and sublime to resemble his lowly creatures who reproduce and have progeny and offspring. So, subhanahu bal ibadun mukramun. And as I mentioned, you know, there's a difference between, al- between ha- alhamd, alhamdulillah, and subhanallah. Alhamdulillah means all praise belongs to God. When you say Alhamdulillah, you are attributing all attributes of perfection to Him. So in a nutshell, Alhamdulillah is what God is. We ascribe to Him all the characteristics and the qualities of perfection. Whereas subhanallah is the opposite. Subhanallah is the negation of all shortcomings and limitations and human-like tendencies from God. So if alhamdulillah is what God is, subhanallah is what God isn't. Subhanahu. So Allah is saying that these prophets who have been called the son of God, for example, Isa ibn Maria, and the malaika who have been called the daughters, Allah says they are ibad. Their relationship to me is the relationship between a master and a slave. Nothing more. They are honored. They are honored slaves and servants. In fact, in Surah Maryam, Surah number 19, verse 93, Allah says that everything in kullu man samawati wal ard, everything in the heavens and in the earth, illa atir rahman abda, everything will return to Allah, return to him. Everything comes to God as an abd. No matter who you are, if Jibra'il is Abdullah, Mikail is Abdullah, Israfil is Abdullah, Isa ibn Maryam is Abdullah, Rasulullah is Abdullah. No matter who you are, no matter how great you are, at the end of the day, you are Allah's abd. Now, the word abd usually in any language really, has negative connotations. You know, the, when, I, when I say the word servant or slave, you automatically think of a master or a tyrant who has subjugated them against their will. But being Allah's abd is different. Being Allah's abd doesn't entail humiliation. Being Allah's abd is the source of honor. It's the only source of honor which is why Allah qualifies the word abd with mukramun. They are honored servants. And mukramun is ism maf'ul. It's uh, meaning they have been honored. And they have been honored, meaning that they don't possess honor in and of themselves. Even their honor has been bestowed upon them by Allah because they excelled in ubudiyah. So because they were great ibad, they were honored. 
So here, so after Allah, he negates, you know, the idea of having children. He mentions six qualities which prove that the prophets or the angels are not his children. Number one, they are his, his servants, his slaves, and they are honored, meaning they have no honor in and of themselves. It's not like, you know, you have your, a child where they're automatically by association, they're, you know, uh, you know, they're attributed to you, or they're honored. They acquire their honor through Ubudiyya. So, Ibad is mentioned. Mukramun. They're honored because of their Ubudiyah. And interestingly, I found a, a verse in Surah Al Ma'idah, in ayah number 18, where it's not among Bani Israel and even among the Christians, many of them refer to themselves as the children of God. So Allah says in ayah number 18 of Surah Al-Ma'idah, وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ وَالنَّصَارَى The Jews and the Christians said, نَحْنُ أَبْنَاءُ اللَّهِ وَأَحِبَّاءُ We are the children of God and His beloveds. We are His favorites. Allah instructs the Prophet to say, قُلْ فَلِمَ يُعَذِّبُكُمْ بِذُنُوبِكُمْ If you are the children of God and you are so beloved to Him, why does He punish you for your sins? بَلْ أَنْتُمْ بَشَرٌ مِّمَّنْ خَلَقٌ You are nothing but His creation. So Allah here emphasizes that the only relationship that exists between us and him is the relationship of creator and created. There's no son, there's no daughter, there's no uncle, there's no spouse. Khaliq makhluk. Malik mamluk. That's, that's the relationship that we have. And then Allah continues des describing these prophets and these angels who have been considered children of God. So Allah says they are Bal Ibadu Mukramun, ayah number 26. La bil They precede him not in speech, and they act according to his command. Why are they so honored? Again, because they excelled, because they were fully devoted to Allah. That what, that's what makes them honorable. They are so respectful of the divine that they do not precede God in speech. You know, malaika, they don't talk unless Allah is addressing them. They don't, you know, they don't, they speak when spoken to. And they act according to his command they act in and again notice how the verb is mentioned before the uh, the object again which is to convey exclusivity Allah didn't say بأمري. بأمري the the fi'l the the verb is en, en, mentioned last Object is mentioned first, which conveys they obey him exclusively. They don't obey anyone but God. So they are fully compliant with Allah. They are devoted. They don't speak out of turn. They don't make a comment unless God reveals to them. They don't speak on behalf of God until he reveals to them. And they act in complete submission and in complete accordance with his will. The malaika, the angels are like this. If you go to Surah an naba ayah number 38, Surah 80, verse 38, Allah speaks about the day of judgment. يَوْمَ يَقُومُ الرُّوحُ وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ صَفًّا لَا يَتَكَلَّمُونَ 
on the day when the spirit is raised and the angels and they will be standing in orderly lines on the day of judgment malaika will be standing in rows allah says la yatakallamun there are trillions upon trillions of malaika even more more than we can imagine they they will all be standing in perfect orderly lines allah says none of them will speak لا يتكلمون إلا من أذن له الرحمن. The only ones who will be able to speak are the ones whom Allah gives permission to. وقال صوابا and those who speak correctly and rightly. So angels they don't speak unless God permits them. They are fully obedient. رسول الله again in سورة النجم we spoke about this verse when we covered the surah. وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحِينْ يُحَىٰ The Prophet doesn't speak on Allah's behalf until the divine command descends. They don't precede him in speech. Allah says in Surah Al-Haqqa, Surah 69, verses 44 and 46, Allah gives us a hypothetical about the Prophet, that if the Prophet was to speak out of his own accord, if he were just to make up things, if he were to precede us in speech, if the Prophet attributed something to us that was not true, Allah is saying, we would have seized him. And we would have severed his jugular vein, meaning that we would have annihilated him. If he spoke, if he preceded God, and his speech. So Allah is saying that these prophets, these angels who you consider to be my children, and in some cases you consider them to be deities in and of themselves, Allah says they are honored servants. Number one, they are servants. They have been honored because of the fact that they've excelled in their ubudiyah. And an example of how great they are as servants, they don't precede me in speech. And they only obey me. They act in full accordance with my command. Now the question is, why are they so obedient? Why are they fully compliant? Allah says, يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ Ayah number 28. يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ وَلَا يَشْفَعُونَ إِلَّا لِمَنِ ارْتَضَى وَهُمْ مِنْ خَشْيَتِهِ مُشْفِقُونَ He knows, he meaning Allah, He knows that which is before them, meaning He knows what they've done in the past, and that which is, you know, He knows that which is before them, meaning what is what they will do in the future. And that which is behind them, he knows their past. So Allah, he knows about their past, their present, and their future. He's omniscient. And they intercede not except for one with whom he is content. They cannot intercede. They have no shafa. They have no power to intercede except if he is content. Wahum. And they are wary for fear of him. So Allah is saying that these honored servants who do not precede me in speech and who act in accordance with my command, they do this because I am the all-knowing. You know, one of the reasons why you would listen to anyone, you know, if I tell you to do something... You, you know, you're going to ask about my credentials, right? It, it, you know, obedience really comes down to knowledge, right? So they obey me because I'm the all-knowing. I know what's good for them. I know their past, their present, their future. I know what benefits them. I know what harms them. So Allah, and by the way, after Allah's rahmah, the most prominent attribute of Allah in the Quran is, is His mercy. And after his mercy, it's his knowledge. The second most emphasized divine attribute in the Quran is his knowledge. So Allah is saying that it's because of my knowledge that they are obedient to me.
They know that their knowledge is deficient and my knowledge is unlimited. And then Allah says that even they are not allowed to intercede except with my permission. And even the ones who intercede, you know, it's one thing to say that the one who's receiving the intercession is afraid. You know, so imagine the day of judgment and you're standing and there's a prophet who's doing shafa'ah for you. Now you as, you know, the defendant, if I want to use, you know, legal terms. Now it makes sense for you to be afraid because your future is in jeopardy. You know, now, but Allah is saying, no, Allah is saying even the shafi'ah, even the intercessor is afraid has this khashya. Now khashya doesn't mean fear. And khashya is basically al-khawf. It's a very specific type of fear. Al-khawf al-muqtarin bit-ta'zimi wal-ihtiram. It's a type of fear that is accompanied with reverence and respect. So even prophets on the day of judgment, they will have this type of khashya because of the majesty, because of the grandeur, because of their great reverence for Allah. So even though they're sinless, just speaking to God directly and interceding makes them anxious. It, has, it creates a bit of anxiety for them. You know, in the same way that when the Prophet and Imam Amir al muminin when they're praying in their mihrab, they faint because they're overwhelmed by the Divine Presence. Here Allah is saying that these individuals, angels, prophets, who you say are my sons and my children and who you take as deities, on the Day of Judgment, even though they are sinless, even though they are the intercessors, they will still have this khashya of me. They will have this fear which is coupled with reverence now even angels you know usually when we think of shafa'a we think of prophets and imams and and others but the quran also mentions that it mentions that angels also intercede there's a hadith from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alayhi, where he says there are four groups who will intercede on the day of judgment. They will intercede for sinners. Obviously, prophets will be able to intercede for their communities. The successors of prophets will also have the ability to intercede. The believers will have the ability to intercede. Now, it's possible for you to need intercession and also intercede for others once you receive that intercession. And we have a hadith that the lowest mu'min on the day of judgment will be able to intercede for 30 people. So if you have the lowest level of iman on the day of judgment, you know, Allah does this to honor people. You know, otherwise Allah can forgive without any need for shafa'a. But shafa'a is a way to honor the God-fearing, honor the righteous. So the lowest ranking mu'min on the day of judgment will be able to intercede for 30 people. So the Prophet says, الشفاعة للأنبياء والأوصياء والمؤمنين والملائكة So even angels Angels will intercede. And this is alluded to in Surah Al-Hadid, verses 7 and 8, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He speaks about the angels that carry the arsh. arsh wa man hawlahu. So you're talking about special high-ranking angels and then other angels. يُسَبِّحُونَ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّهِمْ All angels do tasbih. And they believe in God. Their tasbih is not just lip service. Here. Malaika, they're very beautiful creatures. They, they 
you know, they're, they're concerned about the mu'mineen. They ask Allah and they continually ask Allah to forgive the believers. And look at their dua. Rabbana, ayah number seven. Rabbana wasa'ta kulla shay'in rahmatan wa ilma. Oh Allah, oh our Lord, your mercy has, your mercy and your knowledge has encompassed all things. فَغْفِرْ لِلَّذِينَ تَابُوا So forgive those who have turned to you. تَابُوا وَاتَّبَعُوا سَبِيلَكَ like, And who have followed your path. وَقِهِمْ عَذَابَ الْجَحِيمِ And protect them from the hellfire, from Jahim. And then look, Malaika, they don't stop there. They don't only make dua for the, the, uh, the mu'min. They continue and they say, Rabbana wa adkhilhum jannati adnin illati. So first they ask Allah to forgive our sins, to remove the darkness from our hearts, to protect us from hellfire. And then they say, Rabbana wa adkhilhum jannati adnin illati wa atum. And allow them to enter Jannah to Adn, the higher places in paradise. التي وعدتهم, the paradise that you promised to give them. ومن صلح, and this is really amazing. The malaika, they also say, ومن صلح من آبائهم وأزواجهم وذرياتهم. And oh Allah, also give Jannah to any of their parents, spouses, and children who had even some goodness in them. وَمَنْ صَلَحَ if, there, if there is some salah in them, if there is some goodness in any of them, then also grant them the same. إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ You are Aziz, you have the power to do so, and you are Hakim, you are the wise one. So you see how the malaika, how they... You know, one thing, just one practical lesson that we can take from this is that if we want to be greater than angels in the eyes of Allah, we have to also pray for others. In the same way, malaika, angels, have genuine concern for mu'mineen who are not even the same species, right? You know, it's one thing to pray for for other human beings. So malaika are praying for human beings. So you, they have the spirit of mercy in their hearts. So we human beings, at the very least, we should pray for others. If we want to excel and if we want to surpass malaika, let us first begin by at least imitating some of the qualities of the malaika. وَهُمْ مِنْ خَشْيَتِهِ مُشْفِقُونَ And then... Uh, Ayah number 29, and we'll conclude here, inshallah. وَمَنْ يَقُلْ مِنْهُمْ إِنِّي إِلَاهٌ مِنْ دُونِهِ فَذَالِكَ نَجْزِيهِ جَهَنَّمَ كَذَالِكَ نَجْزِ الظَّالِمِينَ Allah says, and whoever among them would say, if hypothetically, if any of these noble servants, these angels or these prophets, if any of them were to ever say, truly I am a God apart from him. Allah says, فَذَلِكَ The word ذَلِكَ is a demonstrative pronoun. ذَلِكَ is اسم إشارة للبعيد. It's to point to something that is far away. So Allah, right off the bat, He's telling us that if someone claims to be a God other than me, they have removed themselves far away from me. And someone who is far away cannot intercede, right? And Allah says, we will reward them with Jahannam. Their jaza will be Jahannam. كَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ الظَّالِمِينَ and this is how we reward the zalimin. Now, if someone claims to be God, the first person that they are harming is themselves. A zalim is someone who does zulm. 
Someone who claims to be a God is committing zulm against themselves. You are committing a crime against yourself. You are lying to, you are living a lie. You have created a delusion. You are delusional and you have removed yourself from the source of mercy. It's like someone saying that there is an ocean in the middle of the desert. It's, it's, it's the opposite of reality. And they go there to drink water in the desert. The natural consequence of that is you're going to die because there's no water there. So someone who claims to be God is removing his attention from the one true God and consequently they will suffer as a result of that because that is the nature of that sin. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, They do nothing but injustice to their own souls. We ask Allah azza wa jal to illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. We ask Allah azza wa jal to make us among his honored servants. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد أجل فرج Any questions or comments? Welcome, Sheikh. This is interesting. In the in this verse twenty nine. The word that's being used at the end is that this is the evildoer's recompense or reward, which is an interesting choice of words. Instead of using punishment, it's kind of saying this is your uh, reward or recompense. Like, could you explain the significance of, you, of using that word versus punishment? Usually, the word the word jaza has a positive connotation. You know, you work and you get a you get a a jaza a recompense or a reward. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is almost taunting the uh, those who claim to be gods. You know, it's kind of like when uh, when you're, like let's assume that your, your, your son or your daughter, they didn't study, they were heedless, and they failed their exam. And you tell them that I have a, I have a surprise for you when you get home. Now, again, here is a surprise. Surprise, normally surprise is something happy, but in that context, it's used as a threat. So similarly, Allah says, Kadali can that this is how we're going to reward the Valimi. So it's it's a way of kind of taunting them because of the great crime that they committed. Uh, and, and does it also have like a connotation of say a uh, cause and effect, or is this more of a I can't say I can't say with certainty if if in this context uh, jaza is talking about cause and effect, but we do know that punishment in the hereafter is is essentially the hidden reality of the action. You know, the jaza is batin al amal, right? So in the hereafter the hidden dimensions of our actions and our beliefs will become apparent. So someone in this life who claims to be a God, that's an action. Now in this life, you might not feel any suffering, but the natural consequence of that is, is suffering, but it's just not manifested until, uh, until we get to that, uh, that realm where the where, the, where there is no more hidden, everything is apparent. So uh, it could be, but I, I don't know if, if, if we can understand that from the word jaza. It's, it, I think that would be a bit of a stretch to say that the word jaza implies that the, the punishment is, is simply the, the inner reality of the action. Okay, thank you. And uh, regarding the definition of uh, subhanallah, so generally when we use it, we're uh, in conversation, we're talking about when we're praising something in, in people, we say, this is so good, subhanallah. Um, but if you're 
talking about it as the definition of it, meaning that the absence of something bad, how does this kind of apply to the normal conversational use of the word subhanallah? So when you, when you say subhanallah, even though it is, it is used as an expression to, to negate imperfection from, uh, from God, what you're essentially saying is that when you say that he's not a body and uh, he can't be seen and he's unlimited, you're essentially saying that he's perfect. So when you see something that, that kind of evokes amazement in you, you, you basically are declaring you know, uh, his perfection by mentioning subhanAllah, which is to negate anything that, uh, that, is, uh, that would uh, suggest any type of limitation. Whereas alhamdulillah, again, alhamdulillah, at least colloquially, from a colloquial perspective, it's, it's used to kind of, you know, bring your attention to a specific uh, blessing. Whereas, you know, subhanAllah is more to kind of express amazement. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I guess some of this can just be regional variations that were just... Yeah, I, again, you know, a lot of people who say SubhanAllah, they may use it just to ex express, you know, bewilderment or amazement. Uh, but, uh, and a lot, I mean, a lot of people don't really know what SubhanAllah means. But uh, SubhanAllah, it, it, it's kind of focusing, at least from a theological lens, you know, we're talking about, you know, how sublime God is, that he's above, you know, that's why Allah, he always says, Subhanallah, amma yasifun. Glory be to God, he's far above what they ascribe to him. Meaning that we're, 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 we're negating uh, anything that, uh, that, would, that would be considered weakness, limitation, uh, or anything that would, uh, would bring God down to the level of his creation. Okay, yeah, yeah, even because like uh, in St. Pax in India and stuff, we'll often say something like, oh, wow, you've gotten so big, subhanAllah, yeah. or something, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the way that we use it in our everyday language doesn't do justice to the actual meaning, you know? Makes sense. And in verse 28, um, when it says that, uh, the people who will only the, for the intercessors will only intercede um, on behalf of people who Allah is content with. If that's the case, no, no, Liman no. Ertava. It's not that the one who's the, the intercessor is someone who Allah is content with. Okay, okay, but or but it also was that the intercessor will only intercede for people who Allah approves of right or did I misunderstand that verse so so when it, when it says wala yashfa'una illa liman irtada so they will only so the the intercessor they will only in, the ones who will intercede are ones who who God is content with meaning that you have to have a special position to be to, to be able to intercede. Now, what's the whole point of intercession to begin with? Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the ability to forgive without the system of intercession. Yes? The whole point of intercession is number one for us to, to form a relationship with prophets, with imams, because they will be the primary intercessors. And secondly, it's Allah's way of honoring them. That this is one of the ways that Allah honors them, even before they enter paradise. He wants to honor them on the day of judgment. That people, even though I can forgive them, I, I want people to recognize your position. And I want people to know that because of you, I'm, 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 I'm lenient with them. That I'm allowing them to enter paradise because of you. So shafa'ah is really about God honoring those who are obedient and righteous. It's not, it's not that Allah needs a recommendation. You know, Allah already knows. There is nothing the intercessor is going to say that Allah doesn't know. In fact, Allah knows what the intercessor is going to say before the intercessor intercedes. So 
shafa'a is essentially a way of Allah honoring his awliya. That they are so beloved to me that I will, I will make the sinners. And again, this all goes back to the concept of tawassul. The sinners will need these holy personalities for me to give the final pardon. So it's Allah's way of, of honoring his okay. only. And this was interesting when you said that uh, this is also, you mentioned this is a way to, for the sinners to effectively be more motivated to connect with the only and not simply say, hey, I got your message all right. I've got things I'm handling on my own now. Exactly, exactly. You know, subhanAllah, Allah, cho Allah could have spoken to each human being. Like if you think about the concept of revelation, Allah could have sent down wahi upon every human being. But Allah chose special people to deliver his message. So similarly, when we communicate to God, we want to go through those same people. So why is it that we think we can speak directly to God when he chose to speak to us through intermediaries? So when we make our case to God to forgive us, we're, we're using the same system that he put in place, which is the system of tawassul. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, thank you. And in verse 27, what, what does it mean exactly to precede Allah in speech, especially in today's context? How, how would that verse apply to us today? So in our context, I think the best... Uh, the best takeaway lesson for us is uh, is what we covered in uh, in Surah Al-Hujurat, the first ayah. Ya ayuha al-ladhina amanu, la tuqaddimu bayna yadayhi allahi wa rasooli. That, O oh, you who believe, do not advance, do not go ahead of God and his messenger. Meaning, don't do, don't make a decision. Don't do anything without first determining you know what is uh what does allah say about this matter so preceding god in speech is basically to to speak you know at least what we can benefit is to speak and to give a judgment about a matter before you have figured out what is what is allah's what has allah said about this you know so for example inheritance you know before you talk about what you think is most fair don't precede Allah in, in speech. You know, turn to revelation. What has Allah said about the way that an inheritance is supposed to be distributed? That's just, you know, one example. So, you know, going back to the, the idea of Ya ayyuhal ladhina aminu la tuqaddimu bayna yadayillahi wa rasooli. As mentioned in Surah Al-Hujurat, ayah number one.